If you have a copy of God's Word, I'm going to invite you to turn with me to Mark chapter 11 this morning. Mark chapter 11. What a wonderful time of worship it has been here on this Palm Sunday to have literally hundreds upon hundreds of palm branches here signifying that entrance into Jerusalem, uh, singing Hosanna, uh, to see that in all three of our services this morning. And to, I'm going to be a little nervous not to, to, I think I would slide if I got too ambitious with walking around up here. But it has been a wonderful time of worship through prayer and worship through song as our choir and orchestra have so beautifully led us to celebrate this Palm Sunday. I'm thankful that you're here, and as we turn our attention to Mark chapter 11, there are going to be three questions that we want to pose and to hear the clear answers from this Palm Sunday. You know, it's interesting when we think about the way that Jesus' life is given to us. So much of his life, we know very little details about. Many of you read biographies. I, I know that many of you spend time reading the biographies of presidents or reading the biographies of innovators, entrepreneurs, uh, theologians, pastors. You spend your time, so you have some familiarity. I remember about 10 years ago, I had this really non-time-specific goal to read a major biography of all of our presidents, and you'd be happy to know that I've gotten to the 19th president uh, Rutherford B. Hayes, and he is a stumbling block. I cannot get past <laughs> our 19th president. And to be honest with you, I've skipped some to get to him. And so this is one of these lifetime reading goals. But, but you read biographies enough to know that you have to have a well-proportioned sense of one's life lest you spend too much time in the early parts of that person's life or too much time in the... Uh, end of her life. So you, you have to have a well-proportioned sense of scope and pace in a biography. And it's interesting, isn't it? That the gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, spend so much time on the final week of Jesus's life. Mark's gospel gives us a third of his attention to the last week. One third of the gospel of Mark, the last week of Jesus's life. No sense of proportion here. Your, your questions are not answered because Mark is so busy. All throughout Mark's gospel, he's saying immediately, immediately, immediately. He has Jesus and Jesus is in a hurry all throughout Mark's gospel. But it slows down. And we move from this 30,000 foot overview of Jesus' life and we land in Mark chapter 11 there on Palm Sunday and he slows down to focus our attention upon answering three vital questions. Who is Jesus? What has Jesus done for us? And what does Jesus expect of us? Who is Jesus? What has Jesus done for us, and what does Jesus expect of us? Mark chapter 11, verse 1, we read through verse 11, answering the question, who is Jesus? Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem, to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately, immediately, notice that again, as you enter it, you will find a colt tied. On which no one has ever set, untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, the Lord has need of it and will send it back here immediately. And they went away and they found a colt tied at a door outside in the street and they untied it. And some of those standing there said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them what Jesus had said and they let them go. And they brought the colt to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. And many spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut from the fields. And those who went before, and those who followed, were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem, and he went into the temple, and when he looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Who is Jesus? 
Here we have Jesus riding into Jerusalem on what we know historically to be Palm Sunday, and he rides upon a, a colt. Now, this would have been something that in that Greco-Roman world would have had precedence. There were conquering armies that would come into a city and the king would mount a, a massive stallion and have the conquered foes behind him as a way to show, look what we can do. Look at the pillage that we can have behind us. It was a way of showing one's superiority. It was a way of showing one's strength that a king would ride on an animal that was fitting for a king. Here we have the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus, who, who mounts an animal that is more fitting for Bilbo Baggins than for a king, more fitting for a hobbit than a true king, right? Is there anything about this that is accidental? Well, of course the answer is no. Everything about this picture is intentional. It is a fulfillment of prophecy. We know the prophet Zechariah Zachari- in the ninth chapter would write, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. And notice that he comes gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt. Notice how Zechariah so clearly tells us that there is going to be a time where the king of kings is going to come and he will ride not on that stallion but on a colt. Jonathan Edwards, a great 18th century preacher, theologian, he penned a sermon and preached a sermon from Revelation chapter 5 where he connects it to Palm Sunday. And there are two images that the writer John gives us as he's describing the uniqueness of Jesus, that Jesus is both the Lion of Judah and the Lamb that is slain. That both of these animal images in many ways are the polar opposites of each other. The lion, courageous. The lion, the picture of strength. And the lamb, meek, mild. There seem to be, in some respects, in the same breath of Revelation chapter 5, an inherent contradiction. How can one be both a lion and a lamb? But this is the paradox of who Jesus is. He is both the perfect picture of strength and meekness. He is the King of kings and the Lord of lords who in God's infinite wisdom becomes the son of a carpenter without position, prestige, or pedigree. He is the one who is the perfect picture of justice, but yet simultaneously boundless grace. He is the majestic one who is completely humble. He is absolutely sovereign, but yet utterly submissive to his father. He is all sufficient, yet at the same time entirely trusting. He is the lion and the lamb. He is the God man. He's 100% the eternal son of God, but yet he is 100% the earthly son of Mary. This is the great paradox of who Jesus is. He is the God man. This seems to be a contradiction, does it not? No, it is a paradox that he is 100% God, 100% man. Why? Because we as men and women need a God man who could bridge that gap to the infinite holy, righteous standards of God. And only one who is 100% God and 100% man can bring us to live eternally with him. God's son became a man so that sons of men can become sons of God. This is who Jesus is. Jesus is 100% God. And 100% man. Who is Jesus? Second question, what has Jesus done for us? We pick up in the story, verses 15 through 18 of Mark chapter 11. Notice that I'm skipping over a portion that I will come back to, not because I want to avoid it, but because it really buttresses this episode in the temple. We've come to Monday now. We've moved from Palm Sunday. We've come to Monday, and we read in verse 15, they came to Jerusalem. He entered the temple and he began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats 
of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone, not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying to them, Is it not written that my house should be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you've made it. You've made it a den of robbers. And the chief priests and the scribes heard it, and they were seeking a way to destroy him, for they feared him, because all the crowd was astonished at his teaching. What is the meaning of the cleansing of the temple on that Holy Week Monday? What has Jesus done for us? Well, notice the location of where he turns over the tables. It's in the court of the Gentiles. It's the largest section on the outer portion of the temple there. It was a place where Gentiles were able to go, and they could go no further. It was a place where they could worship. It was a place that they could pray. But because of the large section that they had, it was also a place where enterprising entrepreneurs said, we can well, we can help God along in this. We can, because people can't bring pigeons with them from far off. They can't bring a, a spotless lamb with them. So we can sell this. So then they could go into this place. So the court of the Gentiles becomes this busy, bustling place that is hurried and harried. It becomes a place that is distracting. It is intended to be a place where the Gentiles can worship him, but in actuality, it is a place of commotion and chaos. So Jesus comes in and he turns over the tables. And what does it mean for your life and my life? What does it mean for our church? Many of you that maybe have sat in pews before, not only Baptist pews, but other pews, look at this passage And you would hear it sort of one-to-one correlation between the turning over the tables and a little bit of hesitation when the Southern Gospel group comes passing through. Where can you sell their merchandise? But, But I think we're missing the point when we think solely in terms like that. Anytime Jesus does something, and then he interprets it through Old Testament allusions or even direct quotations, we really need to pause and understand what is he saying. Notice what he does. He turns over the tables and he quotes Isaiah. That What does he say? Well, he says clearly that my house shall be called a house of prayer. And notice what he says, for all nations. And here we have the very place where all nations were intended to have access to God in worship and in prayer, but they had been obstructed. There was an obstacle to their access. And so Jesus turning over the tables is saying that this is a place where Gentiles are intended to come and to have access to me, but you've made it an obstacle. I am coming to tear down the obstacles of access. I am coming so that all could have access to the eternal Father. In many ways, this is just a foreshadowing of what's going to occur when he dies upon the cross and that great curtain that divides the holy place from the court of Israel is torn in two. What is the tearing of the curtain mean? It means that once and for all, access is given to anyone and everyone who knows the Son of God by faith. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you have access. The obstacles have come down. You know, it's powerful. When you know someone, when you know someone that knows someone, you become, well, you become pretty popular, don't you? The second church I pastored was in rural county seat, Mississippi, uh, 20 minutes outside of Tupelo, Mississippi. Very interesting relationship that one of our church members who worked every week so faithfully in the nursery, our oldest son, 13, now was at that time uh, 18 months. And so we would see her every Sunday, every Sunday, and we would talk and her daughter was the personal assistant for Justin Timberlake. And this was very fascinating because every Sunday she would start a conversation like this. David, this Friday when I was with Beyonce and Justin and we did such and such. You don't always hear that at a Baptist church. I'm just going to be honest with you. It made Sunday pick up at the nursery very interesting when she had Jessica Alba and Justin Timberlake and Joey Fatone stories. And she would say things like this. She would say, 
I saw Justin this weekend, and I told him that you, Justin, need to listen to my preacher in Oklahoma, Mississippi. And I'm sure he heeded that uh, word right there. She would say all kinds of things, give all kinds of advice, and everyone in this small little Mississippi town would have pictures of them and Justin. They would have signed Justin Timberlake, this or that. And now the reason that they did that was because she had access to his personal assistant. His, his whole life is designed, and it needs to be designed, so that any and every fan doesn't have immediacy to him. So, someone like that needs a bodyguard. Someone like that needs an entourage, lest there are thousands upon thousands of screaming, adoring fans that are knocking on his door all night long. Someone like that needs people to protect him. Someone like that needs access to be limited. But if you know someone, if you know someone, then you can have access not because of your worth, not because of your fandom, not because of your initiative, but because of the relationship that person has with that star. Who do you know? Who do you know that knows somebody? Who do you know that has access to somebody? Now, what I want you to know, if you are a child of the Most High King, you know someone. You know the someone. That a relationship with the infinite creator, God the Father, You know someone who has access to him. So know this, a relationship with God isn't about a secret password that you have to know. No, Jesus is the way. Do you know that someone? There is no mountain of religious achievement that you have to climb. And when you get to the height and you can summit and you've accomplished all the questing, and you've gotten to the top of it, and you've done it all, and you've checked off all the boxes, then you could say, I know God the Father. No, Jesus is the way. Do you know him as your Savior? Do you know him as your Lord? Because it is only through him we have access to the Father. He is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Do you know someone? Who is Jesus? What has Jesus done for us? And what does Jesus expect from us? If we're followers of Jesus Christ, if we're his disciples, are there expectations that he has for each and every one of us? What does he expect of us? We're going back to Mark chapter 11. We go back to verses 12 through 14, those passages that really frame the cleansing temple occurrence here. We read, on the following day, when they came from Bethany, again, this is Monday, he was hungry, that being Jesus, and seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When they came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. So he curses the fig tree. What in the world does this mean? Is this Jesus in a bad mood? Is this Jesus uh, uh, overwhelmed by the pressures of going to the cross? Is the weight of Friday upon him in such a way? And the answer to all of this is, of course not. That within this visual parable, he is making a statement and a point that we must heed. Why does he curse a fig tree that is not bearing fruit when it is out of season? In that Middle Eastern world, there would be fig trees that obviously would come to the spring and then the leaves would come out, but it would be before the figs would come. And so from a distance, it would look as if it was nourishing. From a distance, it would look like it would provide sustenance, but when you got closer to it and you begin to examine it, it was a fruitless tree. And so Jesus, being the infinite Son of God, being omniscient and all-knowing, of course he knows that there are not going to be figs on it. It is a parable that is connected to the temple. Here is this tree that looks vibrant from a distance, but when you get close to it, there is no fruit. And this is the temple. There's tremendous activity at the temple. There is tremendous busyness at the temple. 
But that busyness and activity doesn't equal intimacy. And so the cursing of the fig tree is Jesus' way of speaking not only to the, the activity of the temple, but the distance from a true authentic relationship. But it is your life and it is my life that he is condemning also. Because you know, do you not, that you can be busy doing things for God. You can be busy with a tremendous amount of activity for God, but that activity doesn't always equal intimacy with him. That from a distance, you can look as if there is growth and that there is health, but upon further examination, there is a fruitless life. That this can happen in your life and my life. You don't have to be a preacher for this to happen. You don't have to be a minister for this to happen. You, you, you don't have to be a person that teaches Sunday school week in and week out for this to happen. But as a part of our discipleship, as a part of our growth in Jesus Christ, there can be times in life where our busyness for God replaces our intimacy with God. Is that true in your life? Are there seasons in your life where from a distance it looks as if you're in a healthy relationship, but, but in actuality there isn't the fruit of love and joy and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness and faithfulness and self-control that is vibrantly present in your life? In actuality, do you, do you know that you have to be really close to that fig tree to realize that it doesn't have fruit that is present? And I wonder, are the people that are closest to you, do they realize that fruit is lacking? But, but the people from a distance, the people that just see you far away, oh, here is a person who's in a healthy relationship with God. But the closer that we get, it isn't love, but it is impatience, it isn't kindness, but it is frustration that it spills over to that husband or to that wife to our children, to our co-workers. What do people that get really close to you see present in your life? Uh, many of you might know that John chapter 15 is our memory verse, uh, verse 5 for the month of April. And in the English Standard Version, it reads, I'm the vine, you are the branches. Whatever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit I love this last phrase, for apart from me, you can do nothing. And one of the th realities of your life and my life is that God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, the Holy Spirit, they have a project that is called your life. And the one who began the good work is faithful to bring it to completion. And bearing fruit isn't solely your responsibility. It isn't that God saves you 100% with his grace, and then he says, now, here's the keys to the car called your salvation in your life. Drive it as best you can. See you in heaven. That the one who saves you is the one that is working in you to bear fruit. And one of the ways that he helps you grow in your bearing of fruit is by that pruning process. He highlights that in John chapter 15, verse 1. The branch in me that bears no fruit, he cuts off. But every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. A couple of weeks ago, uh, it's longer than that, probably it's a couple months ago, that I was looking around our house, understanding that spring was coming. I'm not this great order culturalist. I'm not a master gardener by any stretch of the imagination, but I understood enough to know some of these things have to be cut back so they can bear fruit and that they can grow. We have this rose bush that has been uh, kind of grown in such a way over the years that it goes up around our garage and it goes up around here. And that rose bush, I understood, needed to be cut back. So I got a ladder and I got the pruning shears and I climbed up on the top and I just went at it. My seven-year-old comes out of the garage. He looks up at me, looks up at the ladder, looks up at the pruning shears. And he says, Dad, do you know what you're doing? Son, has that ever stopped your dad before? You know, <laughs> not really. I really don't know what I'm doing. I have a master gardener lives, lives one of my neighbors, and so I, I 
kind of got off the ladder. He was outside doing some work. I said, hey, hey, come over here and help me. And, and one of the things he did, he walked around the house. And he said, yeah, you probably need to cut that back. No, don't cut that back. Or, yeah, probably need to wait two more weeks, and then you can cut that back. And so I went back to the rose bush and uh, was cutting this off and then showing Danielle. And Danielle was saying, yeah, do this or do that. I'm going to do this. You can do that. And so at the end of it, I got back on the, the um, ladder, and I, and I started cutting the rose bush. And I heard this voice. Ow. And I said, what was that? And then I realized that my rose bush was talking to me, right? <laughs> and so I said, do you not enjoy this? <laughs> and the rose bush, in a very gentle British accent, because <laughs> what else would a rose bush talk to you in, said, no, I don't enjoy this. And I said, really? I mean, because understand that I'm, I'm pruning some things away here for your good. But the rose bush said, well, it kind of hurts. And I think at times, of course, you do not have to call the personnel committee. My rose bushes are not talking to me. But you understand the fictitious parable that none of us in this room desire to be pruned by the master gardener called God the Father. But because he loves you and because he cares for you, he prunes away those things that impede your growth. What is the obstacle of your life that is impeding your fruitfulness in your life? What are those areas of, of dead branches that need to be cut away? What are some of the relationships that are impeding your future growth in Christ? What are some of those habits that you're holding on to that God the Father in his wisdom wants to take the pruning shears of the Holy Spirit and cut away, not to harm you, but to grow you? And he has different uh, pruning shears that he uses. At times he uses the word of God being preached to comfort you, to convict you, to commend you forward in your life because the word of God is sharper than any two-edged sword. And at times he uses the pruning shear of his word to be able to pull away those areas that impede your growth. At times he uses trials. The trials of life that he allows in our life at times he uses for his glory and our good. Why? So that we would bear much fruit. At times he uses as a father would. He uses the discipline. Sometimes it's the consequences of our sin. Sometimes it is him pulling us back into his loving arms. But whether it be the trials of life, whether it be the discipline of our Father, whether it be the Word of God, all that he does to prune us is for his glory and our good. And I'm here to ask you, what part of your life are you saying, I am not open to your pruning work? I've got better plans for this habit. I got better plans for this relationship. I want to hold on to this. And the Holy Spirit is saying, today in your life, I need to prune this away so that there would be greater, more vibrant growth in your life. Who is Jesus? He's the God man. What has Jesus done for us? He is the someone who gives us access to the Father. And what does Jesus expect of us? He expects us to bear fruit. And so much so that he will not leave us alone. His pruning is for his glory. And child of God, it is for your good, even when it hurts. Let us pray. Lord, it's in this moment that we desire to live under your word. We thank you that that Palm Sunday, that, that Holy Monday, that your actions, your life, your words, they intersect with our life in such a way that we're able to answer so clearly. May the beauty of those answers of who you are and what you have done for us, may it propel us forward in obedient trust 
as you prune away those areas of our life that do not honor you. You do it for our good and your glory. So we trust and we obey. There's no other way to be happy in you, Lord Jesus, but for us to trust and obey even in the midst of the pruning process. Lord, you have a goal for our life and that goal is for us to bear much fruit. May we be those fruit bearers so that when people are close to us, they'd be nourished by the work of the Spirit in us. It's in your name we pray, the saving name of Christ Jesus.